Hi, my name is Nate, owner of Growers House, one of the top suppliers of cultivation equipment in the world. I help growers source equipment and put together some of the largest, most advanced cannabis growing operations. I am constantly looking for the top products and methods needed to grow the best cannabis. Join me on a tour where I get inside access to the industry's leading cannabis grow ops. This, my friends, is Cannacruz. Welcome everyone, it's Nate with Can of Cribs and we're here at episode five in Humboldt County and we're at Honeydew Farms, which is on a ranch that has hundreds of acres and on it they cultivate an amazing amount of cannabis. I'm gonna go meet up with one of the owners, Alex, so I can see how he runs such an awesome farm. Come join me. So after a long day of traveling, we're finally here at Honeydew Farms and I'm with Alex, one of the owners of Honeydew Farms. And please introduce me to Honeydew Farms and how you started growing. Like, how did you start getting into the cannabis industry? I got an opportunity to come out and work on a farm one summer back in 91 here in Honeydew. It was quite an experience. You know, back then, uh, eradication efforts out here were heavy and no one was growing in greenhouses at the time. And so basically we'd start our plants in the greenhouse and then as quickly as we could get them out into the woods, you know, that's, that's what we did. I was lucky and I got here at the right time. Real estate values were super low. It was before the whole big real estate bubble happened. And so we were able to get in early and then we were able to go to the bank and leverage our property, buy more property, leverage that, buy more. And so we ended up getting into commercial real estate, opened a cocktail lounge, uh, opened a restaurant, you know, all thinking that, you know, this was a good fallback for us if, you know, when cannabis went away. Because from the beginning, when I moved here, it was like, this is the last year, man, is what everybody kept saying. And then in 96, it happened. It's over. This is it. It's over. And uh, that was far from, from true. That, that leads me to my next question. I'm thinking about what is the organizational structure of Honeydew Farms? I know that you're a co-owner along with your wife, I believe. Right. So one thing that, you know, we feel is, you know, is uh, unique to our farm as we are, even though we're a large farm, we're a single family owned farm. We didn't bring on any investors. We don't have a, you know, venture capital fund, you know, that we can tap into. Um, it's basically me and my wife, Miranda, and then, you know, our, our team that works under us. And, uh, you know, we have a great team this year. We've got people that have been with us, you know, for, for several years. And then we've got people that, you know, this is their first year in cannabis and this is their, you know, their, their first year on a cannabis farm. When we, when I moved to Humboldt originally, I didn't move here, um, to grow cannabis. Um, I moved here because I fell in love with the landscape and, um, then I learned to grow cannabis and I, you know, I now love growing cannabis. Um, but you know, our, we're deeply connected to our ranch here and, um, it was, felt really lucky to get it. I feel like if I sold it, we would never be able to get something like this again. And, uh, you know, my dream, and I know Miranda's is, is that someday our kids will be running the farm, you know? So that's our plan. Wow, Alex. This is the first greenhouse of the day, and that was kind of a crazy adventure getting to your farm. I had to drive an hour and a half through the redwoods on this windy road, probably going 20 miles an hour, away from Eureka, which is only 30,000 people. And now I'm like in the middle of the Shire of Cannabis. It has that old Humboldt feel, and it's still holding on to that character, I think, that, that really describes Humboldt. Absolutely, I think the comparison a lot is that Humboldt is the Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the wine industry of cannabis. And uh, I definitely agree with that. The climate here in particular, the hot days, the cold nights, really attribute to growing some of the best cannabis mm -hmm. in the, I believe, the world. So let's start off with genetics for you guys. I mean, how many, how many different strains are you growing on this, on this facility? Um, this season, we're, I think we're right around 40. And you know, these, these uh, the, we, call, we call them cuts, these clones, coming into your farm, it sounds like when you were, you know, even a few years ago, when the market was a little bit different, those are things that you would buy from a nursery, 
but you guys are bringing in house now, doing your own cloning. Yeah, that was definitely when we were a much smaller footprint. We were we were sourcing out our clones just because we didn't have really the space uh, to do it at the time. Uh, now that we've expanded significantly, uh, sourcing clones from other companies is just too expensive, and so we're we're just doing it in house and. We're uh, streamlining and uh, diversifying a little bit, and yeah, we're, we're, we've kind of taken our genetics and propagation in-house. We're using a Rockwell Cube. I think mm -hmm. uh, Grodan is the, is the brand we're using, and then um, we're actually using a Red X product, mm -hmm. which is like a hormoning solution that you dip the Rockwell Cube into, mm -hmm. take our cutting, dip that in there, plug it in, put it on a shelf under fluorescent light, uh, mm -hmm. give it, depending on the strain, usually 10 days to two weeks. Mm -hmm. Once you see the roots popping out of the bottom, then it's time to where we take it up into one of our greenhouses, our nurseries, and then we transplant it into soil. But you're having pretty good rooting success with uh, your current methodology right now? This year, yeah, we, we nailed it. We have mm -hmm. hardly any any loss at all um, mm -hmm. in our yeah in our cloning room. Uh, our team did it, like an amazing job. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Let's jump into that veg process you were talking about. I really want to know about the methodologies and the products that you're using that will work so well for you guys. Once we have a rooted, a rooted clone, a rooted cutting, uh, we then take the cube um, and we transplant those into a two gallon pot. So mm -hmm. the two gallon pot, we're using potting soil right now. We're using a World Gold's King Mix. Mm -hmm. That's just the soil of the season. Mm -hmm. um, we then basically will set up a table and we'll take the great white that we were talking about, take the cube, dip it in the great white, and then we'll transplant it into the two gallon pot. Got it. Um, the mycorrhiza and the great white really helps the roots to take off and kind of helps with, with basic stress of the plant. Mm -hmm. As we go, we always add amendments. You know, any of the soil companies, the amendments that come in their soil, they're only gonna last for so long. Yeah. And then you're gonna need to add, you know, amendments or you're gonna have to liquid feed with them. So mm -hmm. depending if they're gonna go into a light depth, we'll transplant them into a two gallon pot. We'll veg them usually for four to six weeks. If they're gonna be going into our full term uh, gardens, we'll transplant them into a three gallon pot and then we'll grow them for about six weeks again in the greenhouse and then we transplant them out into the field. I would love to hop into one of these Agritech greenhouses that you said you had and maybe talk a little bit more. Yeah, wanna do it? Yeah, cool, Let's check it out. Well, we've got uh, an acre and a half of greenhouse on the entire ranch. Um, we went to this uh, Agritech cold frame last year, and I'm really happy with it. Kind of like the idea of having a, a smaller greenhouse. It's a little easier to control the environment. Um, the thing that's really nice about them is when you get the kit, everything lines up. Every, yeah. you know, bolt hole lines up perfectly. Um, you know, when you're putting together a frame like this and things don't line up, it can, it can definitely be, you know, yeah. a pain in the ass. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so we're able to manually roll up our sides to six feet. Yeah. And so basically we can almost, you know, it's almost like having a convertible, you know, greenhouse. We roll the sides up, we get ni nice fresh air blowing through. And then when the weather cools down at night, we manually roll the sides back yeah. down. And I wanted to go over in more detail about your nutrient regimen. What are these plants being fed? I wanna hear about that. The plants are tapped into the amendment mix. So we'll send the, the soil to a lab. They come back with what it's lacking, what it still has left over from last year. Mm -hmm. We pass that on to our friend at, uh, that owns T-Lab. Yeah. And then he builds us an amendment mix that is specific for that bed. Uh, when we pull the pot off the roots, if the roots are nice and healthy and looking great, we plug it right in. If they look like they could need a little bit more love, we go back to that gray white, the mycorrhiza, and we put a little bit of that in the hole, Got it. plop it in on top. Mm -hmm. Then once it's in, we like to come in with an organic um, fertilizer after that, just to keep the plant happy. We use the BioMarine and we also use the BioGrow. We also use Vital Gardens, um, Vital Grow and their Vital Mag in that process as well. And then once the plants get tapped in, we back off the food because you don't want to like over fertilize a plant. Alex, so we're at the River Flat, one of the many sites you have on property. Why do you guys call it the River Flat? Because uh, it's a 
big flat right along the river. Oh, okay. We keep it basic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes yeah. sense. So you, you were saying that this field is grown from seeds, I believe, is that correct? This is our seed section, yes. Historically speaking, the, you know, when we originally were kind of building the farm out, you know, we were kind of spreading out our greenhouses to kind of capture different microclimates. Mm -hmm. And so what's gonna happen up on the ridge is gonna be very different from what happens down here on the river. Um, I've noticed that a lot of these plants are growing in pots, like tan smart pots, these right? These are smart pots, yep. Yep, so when you were talking about a 20-year-old soil, I mean, how do you do that with smart pots, fabric pots? Um, so the fabric pots actually uh, hold up pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where we've had to replace any of them yet. This is year five down here. Wow, that's a long so, time. Um, what I like about the smart pot is, uh, for one, it's, it's a fabric pot. So just when you're getting it here, the cost compared to a plastic pot of the same size is a fraction of it. Mm -hmm. And the pots actually do allow the roots to breathe a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of feel like, you know, in terms of plant stress, when the roots get to the edge of the pot, rather than like hitting hot black plastic, it hits the fabric, which like I said, it just gives it a little bit of air. Mm -hmm. And so you don't kind of get the browning roots around the edge. One of the most unique things about your ranch is that you have these Scottish Highland cows, these furry cows, which I have never seen before. They're so cute. And I thought maybe, maybe you're a rancher and you um, slaughter them for beef, but it turns out you're using them for something entirely different. Yeah, we do. Um, actually, we use them to manage the ranch. So the cows are essential um, in just keeping the ranch grazed off uh, for fire prevention, especially. Uh, the highlands, we're up to probably, oh, we're in the 40s. Oh, you are? Yeah. We actually have a couple herds of cattle here on the ranch. We've got the Scottish highlands, and then we also have Belt of Galloways, too. Wow. Some, some, some exotic cows to go with our exotic strains. That's about as yeah. organic as it gets. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, Alex, is there a reason why you chose to do hand watering for all of your fields? Um, well, originally, the reason was because the state hadn't finalized its rules, basically. So the county gave us a permit, and we didn't know exactly how the state was going to have us break our permits up. Um, and so we didn't want to put in an irrigation system that we were then going to have to tear out if the rules changed. And so we've been hand watering ever since. Um, the nice thing about hand watering is it gives us complete control of each specific plant. What goes in, you know, inside of this water that we're talking about? Are you adding any other nutrients in flour? Towards the end of flour, we use uh, organic liquid fertilizers, the same that we're using in our beds. So we're using Vital Bloom this year, which comes from Vital Garden Supply. So another product we're using here is um, from Sensational Solutions. A friend of ours, Marty, owns the company. We really like to support local companies. Um, one thing I really like about Marty's product is it's, um, it's micronized. So basically you just mix it with water. It breaks down really well. You don't have any clogging of emitters or your hose. Um, we like to start with his grow, then we go into his transition. This product right here, it was really amazing how it slowed down the vegetative growth from the transition from veg to, to flower, and it really helped the plants really branch out a lot. And then once we're done with the transition, we roll into his blissful bloom. And we use all of these products on top of the amendments that we've already put into the soil earlier in the season. Yeah, well, I understand Luke from T-Lab is actually here today because he's here quite a bit doing some soil sampling up on the terrace. Why don't we go say hi to Luke and see some more about that soil sampling? Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. So Luke, I've already heard so much about T-Lab because you guys are so integral into this farm. So. What is tea lab? I need a good definition of this. Tea lab, well, it comes from compost tea. Okay. Compost tea being a living fertilizer, the microbes in tea are going to help unlock nutrients that we're putting into the soil. Mm -hmm. The lab from tea lab is Luke Ander Besmer, my initials. It's my way of putting my stamp on the company. From what I understand, you guys are actually sending out soil samples to a laboratory. So it's yeah. kind of a double a, entendre. A double entendre, yes, absolutely. Okay. It okay. worked, worked out really well. So how do you do something like that for someone like Alex on a farm like this? So what we'll do is come out, we'll dig from the top of the pot to the bottom, bottom of the pot, scrape the side of that hole so we have a nice stratified layer of soil. Then we'll mix a bunch of those together so we have a composite sample, and then that sample goes off to the laboratory. About a week later, I'll get results back, and then with those results, I'll go ahead and tailor a custom fertilizer blend for the soil. Okay, so that's what plants just like this are thriving on. And this Absolutely. plant looks great over here. I mean, if you see how these nugs are stacking and the coloration is very purple, it's beautiful. Yeah, this plant especially, Platinum Punch, whoever bred this is, knows what they're doing. 
for a farm like this, why would Alex choose using T-Lab over, let's say, traditional liquid nutrients? Cost and ease of use mm -hmm. and the quality that you get out of organic nutrients. The cost to grow a gram when you're doing this T-Lab is in the four to five cent range. So the numbers really work out really well, especially this day and age when farms need to keep their costs as low as possible. Where, what's your background? Do you have uh, some type of certification maybe? Or? Yeah, I am a certified crop advisor. Okay. But well beyond that, I have a degree in biology, a minor in botany from Humboldt State University. So we practically uh, studied smoking weed, just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, that combined with, I worked at a large scale propagation facility down in San Diego for a couple years. That's where I learned about testing and how we could use science to really give us some answers. I moved back up here and I saw how many people were throwing out their soil every run and it's extremely wasteful. I knew that with testing and proper planning that we could reuse that soil. And we've saved people thousands, if not millions of dollars at this point. So you're a certified crop advisor. Do you work with just cannabis or you work with other crops as well? Other crops as well. That's the thing about this organic method is that you can use it on all kinds of plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're also doing, if I understand correctly, some IPM, the integrated pest management over here. So what have you guys used on Alex's farm here? Safe stuff that's low cost like sulfur. It's very effective. Beyond that, Regalia and Grandivo, two great products for keeping plants strong and keeping pests down. One of the main things though is monitoring and just having eyes on every plant, walking around the gardens and making sure that there are no bugs. The second that you see a bug, you act on it. You make sure that that infestation doesn't grow any further than it has to do. One thing that really worked well this year was keeping an eye on things in the nursery. We wanted to make sure that no plants getting to these fields had any bugs on it, and we were successful. And you can see it in the plants now. I've been monitoring this place every other week for the past several months, and I have not found a mite, a russet mite, an aphid, a thrip. This is the cleanest garden I've seen in a long time, which is a real testament to the hard work these guys are doing out here because it's such a massive garden. You would expect to find some kind of insects. Luke, with your extensive knowledge about plants and bugs and their interactivity, I think we're going to be talking in the future with regard to the Growers Network Pest and Disease Database software. But on that note, I'm going to go meet up with Alex and go see the next step in the process for these cannabis plants. Uh, out of the flower room into this room. I know that's where these plants are headed, even though it's empty now, because this is your drying room. As soon as those plants get chopped down, they're coming in here, right? Yeah, this is one of our many drying rooms. So this will be mm -hmm. the first stop after harvesting in the field. Um, we generally in the field will will buck a plant, a branch to you know about this length, and then we bring it in here, and then we'll hang in here for. Uh, generally, we like to get them down into totes in about five days. You know, you think, you know, you walk up to the cure room, you're feeling the first few rows. Oh yeah, they feel good, they feel crispy, everything's good. And then you start taking it down and as you get deeper in here to the middle, it just starts getting wetter and wetter. Mm -hmm. And you can literally have problems that you have in the field can actually happen here in the drying room too, where if you don't have your humidity and your airflow correct, you can actually get like powder mildew can start in the drying room and literally like blow up and destroy your crop. Wow, yeah, well you don't want that to happen. So like what's part of your, your recipe for, um, I would say, drying and curing? Because I know everyone does it a little bit differently and it, like you were saying, it can make or break you. The first 12 hours, we like to raise the temperature a little bit in our room, so about 85 degrees, and then we will put multiple dehumidifiers in so we can get the leaves to drop within the first night. That way you know, you know, just visually you can see, you know, that the process is happening. And then, you know, once you get to that point is when you then start to kind of back off of things. And you just really got to get in here. You got to crawl all the way through, pop up at different spots and feel the flower throughout because yeah. it can be drier there than it is here in the middle. And so that's what's really cool about 
These dehumidifiers is we can literally wheel them wherever we want all over the room. We can take them down to the packaging room. We can take them across the river to the other drying zone, um, you know, and so that's kind of why we're using this company right now, Ideal. Uh, so you're measuring moisture by hand and are you using like a meter? Maybe, we right? use moisture meters yeah. and um, I mean, I'm kind of old school. I like to put my hands on things. Well, that's, know? yeah, it's yeah, a so, subjective touch of a yeah, long time like, grower. What are you using that meter for? They're like, no, the moisture, this is what is in the middle of the bud, you know, and, and I'm evolving. Which yeah. is the good news, you know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm 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 pretty old school in my caring. Yeah. Well, um, after this room, they're headed downstairs into that giant burping room yeah. that we came through. So why don't we head down there to take a look? Alex, another room where I know that a lot of action is going to be happening in here and you guys are just preparing for it. I mean, look at how many totes you have back here. These have built up over the years, haven't they? Uh, yes, and that is a fraction. We're now having to build buildings to store totes, which seems kind of ridiculous. Yeah, but it's but necessary. That's crazy. And I mean, yeah. this room, you were saying that, I mean, it's basically completely full of totes that are basically curing cannabis. Yeah, so the room that we were just in upstairs, um, that's where everything is hanging and drying. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, that's gonna happen down here too for the first harvest. And then once we get the first big one in, everything goes into totes. This room then fills up with totes to the ceiling. So I think as I mentioned to you, um, we are building another tote building and drying building. Um, this year, we're going to need a couple more of those for next year. I had mentioned last year we ran out of space, so we basically had to take all the furniture out of our house, mm -hmm. and uh, we filled that up with totes. Wow. Yeah. So we don't want to do that again this year. You we're going to go into what I consider maybe one of your guys' core competencies, and I think it's due to the story of your and Miranda's family business and having that humble roots, and that's you guys' packaging and branding. You know, we love the kind of iconic um, image of, like, the Marlboro Man. At the same time, wanted it to kind of have a bit of a, like a Sailor Jerry type vibe to it. And we look over at the bottle of wine and we're like, well, whoever did this labeling is who we need to get a hold of. The company's name is and they're a renowned wine branding company. I think they've got about 500 pretty well-known wines that they do all their branding for. And we contacted them and he said, yeah, you know, I'll check it out. And so we ended up going down to Sonoma, um, Calistoga, and we met him. He says, well, you know, normally um, we do everything from like the bottom up. So you guys already have a logo, so I'm not really sure what you want us to do. And so he's sitting there and he's kind of thinking about it and Miranda pulls out a jar out of her bag and it's full of weed. And so I'm looking at her, I'm like, Really? You brought like the weed? <laughs> and so she's like, well, I want him to see like visually what it's going to look like in a jar. And so she opens up this jar and like the room just like blows up with the smell of weed. And we don't know this guy, you know, and he's sitting there and he's kind of like very like chill, chill guy. And he's like, he's like, you know what? I think I'm going to, I think we're going to take this on. Alex, where do you source, you know, most of the equipment that you use for this packaging, all these accessories? Um, well, uh, it, you know, we took our time. You know, there's, there's a lot of different vendors out there. Um, we really like the pollen gear, and so we settled with uh, Green Lane Dispensary Services, actually, mm -hmm. carries it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to, you know, we're able to buy in bulk from them. There's a lot of logistics now, whereas before it was like you just trimmed it, put it in a bag, and sold it. Now we have to trim it, that process is done, it goes in a bag, it gets sealed up, we put the Bovida packs in there to keep the humidity perfect. Mm -hmm. We'll store it in the bags and then when we get orders, we then open the bags up and then we pack it into the jar. As you can see, the people here working are doing the labeling, so it's, it's quite a process. We actually put a Bovida pack inside of each jar to keep the humidity perfect. Mm -hmm. So when it gets to the consumer and they open it up, it's exactly the way it was on the farm. Um, we do offer our ACE as well in a resealable childproof bag that we actually get through uh, Kush bottles. Mm -hmm. How many jars do you think you guys are doing, let's say a month or every two months or something like that? Oh man, I think, you know, things really kicked up around July 1st and I think that we've probably, you know, purchased at least maybe 150,000 to 200,000 jars. Wow. Yeah, so a semi truck shows up and there's, you know, 10 pallets of jars 
you know? And just like what I was talking about before with the totes, it's like now we need a building to store our totes. Now we need space to store our jars. Now we need, you know, it's just, it's just creating, you know, you just need more and more and more infrastructure, you know, to be able to kind of do this whole process now. Our process is, uh, it's, it's a little time consuming, but it's just really important to us that, you know, what's going in this jar is perfect. So basically everything for one is hand trimmed. So the people that are doing our trimming can identify any problems with the flower during that process. Um, I think that a lot of that stuff gets missed when you run it through a trim machine or, or it has the potential to. So we'll hand trim it, and then when we're done, like I had mentioned, it goes into a sealed bag. Shield and Seal is the company we're using. Um, so it'll sit in that bag with a bovita pack. Um, we want to keep the humidity perfect, stored in a nice, cool, um, you know, locked shipping container. When we get an order, we then will package it into the jar after that. You know, I think it's time for me to hand Louie off. As sad as I am, but here you go. I'll right, we'll take Louie. I'll take huh? the old hand off. There you go, buddy. The little mascot. Well. Got a little something for you, a little parting uh, gift. A little parting gift. Good luck with that. It's childproof. Ah, I think that says something after hanging out with me for a day. Totally. <laughs> well, Cannon Cribs, episode five, Humboldt County. This is a wrap. We found ourselves amongst these giants here in Humboldt County, and it's giving us the opportunity to smoke some of this Honeydew Farms beautiful California weed. I'm about to get lost in this forest with my crew. Stay tuned for our next adventure. Look at me, where they say we ain't supposed to be.